Okay. Great. Um, so uh, today, uh, our focus of discussion lies in um, on the uh, first lecture, first sort of lecture one, not lecture zero, of the Programming with Categories uh, lecture and uh, the MIT 2020 Programming with Categories course. Um, I'd ask you to watch that video uh, before this, uh, this meeting. And um, I trust that uh, most or all of you have had a chance to do so. Uh, I had prepared some slides which, which talk about some major emphases of that video and um, discuss uh, you know, some broader uh, perspectives from those. Um, uh, Jermaine, for the uh, for for your broader understanding and the rest of that course, but uh, I wanted to in this session and in other sessions really, you know, put an emphasis on clarifying points that might have been confusing to you um, to deal with issues that you might uh, not uh, understand, um, you know, upon first hearing, and you'd like to get clarity on them. So I wanted to to prioritize. Uh, are there any questions you would like to ask about that video? Confusions, things you'd like to discuss, so that we could hit those first before I show any slides and and sort of talk about things that I I think are important for emphasis. Any any things we could deal with uh, from your side? Well, are we going to at some point take up the take home exercise or? Good question. Yeah. Should I ask a question that kind of ties into that? Yeah. Yeah. You should ask a question that, that ties into that. Um, this would be a good time to, to talk about that. And I could um, speak about uh, in detail the take home exercise and, um, you know, any of the sub problems on that. So please. Yeah. So, uh... When you have, when you're, when you're dealing with uh, a function from uh, zero underbar to some yes. non-zero, yeah. In the lecture, he says there's one function and it vacuously satisfies the rule, but yeah. it's not clear to me what that function is or if we can even express it clearly. Yeah. So. This is a great question, and it requires at once some um, some thinking in a in a very specific way about uh, what's meant by a function, and and a certain willingness to kind of think more broadly about um, you know um, a, a rather slippery notion. So. The very specific notion I want to hit on here is um, this notion of, of what it means to have a function from a set A to a set B. And what it means is that for each and every possible value of A, you pick a designated value of B to which it maps. That will specify, if you do that for each element of A, it will specify a function, right? Um, and um, if we have just one member of A, for that one member of A, we, well, we pick one of the members of B and we're done. And um, if there are several members of B, like two possible members, it'll be one function, which just, you know, takes the only thing in A and maps it to the first possible element of B, that'll be one function. The other function will be well, it takes the only element of A and maps it to the alternative value of B. Um, um, and you know, if there are two things in A, for each of those, we would need to specify what it maps to in B, right? Um, but how if there's zero things? Well, the reason we say it's vacuously satisfied is, well, we the, the, the requirement for a function is for every single thing in A, we need to specify a mapping. Well, there's nothing in A. There's, there's nothing to do. It's, it's kind of, um, we, we specified it by not having to specify anything because there's no value in A. 
at all. And so it's kind of vacuous in that sense. Like we, we don't have to specify anything because there's no work to do. Um, and, and you could say, well, wait, there's all these elements in B, you know, B maybe has, you know, um, apple, um, apple, banana, um, cantaloupe. Um, and, you know, if there were something in A, we'd have to pick one of them, but here there's nothing in A. So it kind of is, is this function, is it a, you would say like, is there a, a function? Yeah, you could say that's a function because it satisfies function. Every single value of A specifies some value of B. There just are no values of A. So it's kind of vacuously that there is a function. And um, so there is one, but there's not more than one because there's no choice in the matter. There's, there's nothing to specify. There's no, there's no alternatives because, you know, there's, there's no choices to be made, to be had. Um, so in that sense, there's one function to rule them all. It's just kind of um, vacuously true, we say. And in Haskell, it's actually called absurd. Um, it's, it's the name of the function because it's kind of absurdly true. It's, it's from zero to nothing um, uh, or to, you know, it, it, it just is, um, and there's no choice in the matter. It just is, and that's it. Um, and you can have as many elements as you want in B, um, and, and there's no choice in the matter. So it's just one function. It doesn't depend on the size of B. And uh, it, 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 we, we call that the single vacuous function that exists. That's the convention there. And I recognize it, it may kind of stick in your craw a bit. Um, I, can, I can recognize why that is, but it also doesn't seem totally unreasonable um, that you might have that rule. Uh, and I will further say that if, if, a, if B had zero, if there's nothing possible in B, you would still have this vacuous function because there's no choices to be had. So it doesn't matter. There's no choice in B. Um, there's no possible choice because there's no choices you have to make. Um, and so you, you'd say, okay, you know, that's also one. There's still a function there. It's not harmed by the fact that B has no choices to make. I don't know if what, I, if what I'm commenting is helpful at all, but that's how I think about it um, when I think about this matter of kind of mapping from an A that's empty. It's, there's no choices to be made. So it doesn't matter what B is, it ain't, it, it ain't relevant because there's no choices to be made. So there's just one function to rule them all. Does that make sense? Conceptually it does. Like, I, I guess the other kind of part of my confusion is in terms of the assignment, how do we express that? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. So I, I understand what you're saying there. Um, I think you would say one function uh, doesn't, like, regardless of what it maps to, you know, one function doesn't map to anything um, uh, because there's nothing to map or something like that. I wanted to struggle with it to to deal with this, you know, this tension, because it is a, um, yeah, thanks, Alex. That's, that's great, uh, uh, data void. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, um, it is a bit slippery. Um, I think it's easier to think about if there's a set A that's non-zero, and you map it to a, Set, you try to map it to a set B that's empty, there's no choices, then obviously it's zero because like you can't satisfy the rules for a function, right? For each element of A, you have to specify an element of B to which maps and there's no possible elements of B. And so 
there's zero functions that satisfy that because it's not possible. But this is um, this is uh, a case where it's you know there's there's just no work to be done. So it's um, it's it's kind of a vacuously vacuously true. Um, and uh, for me, I've kind of come to peace with it. Um, I think it kind of makes sense uh, from the from the terms that I used for it. There's no choices to be had, it, it, so it doesn't depend on B. Um, it doesn't depend on B even being non-empty. Um, it uh, it it obviously exists because it satisfies the rules for a function. It's just uh, it doesn't depend on B, and so it's. Uh, you know, a value of one seems perfectly reasonable. There's no choices. There's no differentiation between them. So I would think of it that way. I maybe maybe think about it a bit more. Um, I'll have to read about the the uh, uh, a little bit about Alex's comment there on the principle of explosion. Um, uh, and but. Maybe maybe that's helpful. Uh, there are some category theoretic books that might also give a, a good perspective on it. Anyone else want to come forward how they think about it? So maybe a, additional items to discuss here that were troubling you or confused you, et cetera. I guess I had um, one piece, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to do with the take home assignment. It was okay. more about the language that was used. Yeah. Um, so we start, you know, talking about functions and it's a really, really good introduction um, into like how all of the pieces kind of fit together. And when we get to category, he starts defining things as morphisms. Mm -hmm. I just, I guess I wanted a clarification on the relationship of Great. morphisms to what we talked to like to everything else that we had already like like to me they look obviously like a lot like functions but it's not quite yeah. a function it's morphism yeah okay so so let's talk about that and actually i have some slides related to that and I, i'd like to speak about it maybe i'll just mention one more thing on the function mapping side and we can deal with it i i do just want to say you know for me when i think about the mappings between functions um from a from a set A to a set B. It's quite nice for me to think about, if I think about the number of functions, I think about B as a computer scientist, um, you know, being like one and zero, one, a value of possible one and zero. And so if I have a set A of like three items in it, I know that just intuitively as a computer scientist, I know basically what that's saying is, you know, pick all the possible three, you know, the all, all the possible bit encodings where you have three bits in a row, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, and so on. Um, because it's 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 assigning each of those three possibilities, each of the three bits, or each of the three positions to us to a bit of either zero or one. And I know there's eight of them, right? Um and, and it, it's mapping to from a three element thing to a two element thing. And so it's two to the third power. And that kind of makes sense because for each of the items in category A, you get the choice of the items in category B. So for the first position, we get two. For the second position, we get two. So that's times two. For the third position, we get two. So it's kind of like B times B times B, which is, B to the A, um, B to the eighth power. So, um, you know, I like to think of it kind of that, that way, that think about mapping it to a bit vector sort of excites my intuition as a computer scientist. And it always makes it clear that, you know, the thing we're mapping to is the thing in the base of the exponent, uh, the thing of the base and the exponent is the thing we're mapping from which we're mapping. So it's B to the A, not A to the B. It's B to the A. A goes to B. And if you can think of it this way, the intuition is going to carry over in a really nice way. Because we're going to find out that there's a thing called the exponential object. 
which is going to represent functions from A to the B, which are turn out to be objects to object. It's going to be a morphism. It's going to represent things going from object A to object B. Um, and that's a really nice, um, um, a really nice kind of way of always remembering this. And you can think of, you know, why is it B to the A? Well, for each of the A's, you're multiplying a B. You have to specify a B and one, one of the two possible B's for the first item in A, for the second item in A, for the third. And it turns out that will come up really useful for some later parts of the course, if, if you carry around that intuition. Um, it'll come up with the issue of, uh, of currying, actually, um, and uh, some issue of kind of interchangeability uh, between tuples and functions and stuff like that. Um, so, so we'll we'll come back to this um, to this issue, but that's a useful way to to think about it. Um, you can also imagine as a table, for each of the possible values of a, you have to give a value of b. All right. Um, so it's like a table. You look up for the first one. What's the value? Of B you have for the second one, what's the value of B? What's the third one? What's the value of B? Um, so we'll come back to that intuition later. Um, but I want to talk about the function and morphism thing. So I'm going to, for this, I'm going to go to some slides without going through them all uh, really one by one. So we're talking about these uh, these two lectures and, and this lecture in particular right now, lecture one. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, uh, there are these kind of background things. Okay, um, so um, I think I'm going to um, to talk about this. So in the context of categories, we talk about morphisms. And Jenna, um, there are important categories where the morphisms are functions. In general, morphisms we talk about as arrows or maps. And Arguably, the single biggest one we keep in our minds uh, as a point of reference is a function. It's a, it's a type of map from a set to a set. That's the thing. A function is a morphism going from set to set. But there's lots of other types of morphisms. And when we have a category, we have objects and we have these morphisms or arrows or maps. Um, and we write, you know, for any two objects in the category, we can, we can say, what's the set? of all morphisms um, between them. And that's C of A comma B. C is the name of the category, objects of the category, object of C. And the morphisms between any two objects, A and B, are written as C of A comma B. Or they're written in somewhat of an older style as Hom C of A, B. Um, uh, and these are kind of arrows from A to B. Uh, how many, the set, this is the set of all arrows from A to B a set of all morphisms from A to B. And you may say, why more morphism? Well, because while well, functions are morphisms, there's a lot of categories where functions are not morphisms. And it's worth being careful about this because category theory, more than anything else, it's defined by relations. It's defined by these arrows. It's defined by these morphisms. Um, Category theory is a subject, as David Spivak says, that takes morphisms really seriously. And it takes it seriously in the sense that it, you know, it talks about an identity morphism for every object. We have this special one from A to A. There can be other ones that are not identity from A to A, but we have a very special one that's the identity morphism. And what makes it special? Well, we when we compose it with another morphism, say from, so we have a, an identity one from A to A, and then we have morphism from, let's say, A to B. Then we can compose that and we just, if we compose them, we, we do the first one first from A to A, and then we do A to B. We just get, it's just the same as just going A to B. It's the same morphism as we gave it for A to B. It doesn't matter that we, Prepended with, we can prepend with it as many times as we want. We'll get the same thing from A to B, um, and and that's what makes an identity. Now, um, uh, these have to satisfy these these rules here. Um, I'm going to go light so I can answer Jenna's questions because 
the, you know, the foremost thing we think about often as computer scientists here are the, this category, pseudo category, um, quasi category of Hask, of uh, a Haskell inspired category where each object is a type, let's say int or bool or float and where the morphisms between them are functions. Mm. So a morphism here is a function. In this category, morphism is a function. All morphisms in this category are functions. Um, uh, so between int and bool, we have is even, right? It maps, it maps from an int to a bool. Um, maps from ints to bools. Um, ceiling maps from float to int. Uh, is negative maps from float to bool. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a really useful thing to think about. So in this category, all morphisms are functions. They're functions between type. They take in an int and they take in a bool. And in case you're worried, well, they can only take in one thing and the functions I write take in many things. No, 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 you could have like a pair. Um, so you could have a, a pair of uh, int and bool and that will be a type as well as happens not to be shown. And you could have a map from that to float. Um, so, so it's not like you can only take one argument by taking a, a pair of them or a tuple of them, like a triple. It's like you could take many, many things. So this is a category where morphisms are functions. All morphisms in this category are functions. They're functions between these types. Hmm, that's a perfectly good category. But now let's stretch ourselves. Um, here's a category where morphisms are not functions. Morphisms are what? Numbers. They're numbers. You know, zero, one, two, three, four. Mm. The object, what's the object here? Well, we don't even give it a, a proper name. It's like star. It's just, it's just, don't get caught up in the name. It's just, it's just some name. There's a single object. That's all there is. This is, a, this is a category with super simple object structure. Later, we'll see one with super simple morphism structure. But what are the morphisms? Well, there's morphisms from this object to itself, zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and, um, and there's many others. There's five, there's six. They're all possible. There's a morphism for each natural number, zero, one, two, three, four. The zero one is the identity morphism. Um, and these others are also from star to itself. They're maps from star to itself, or they're arrows from star to itself. Um, but they're not functions. They're, in fact, they kind of represent the numbers. And, and remember, like when we specify a category, we have to, we, we say what the morphisms are, but we, we can't just say willy nilly, oh, or whatever I want. Um, we have to have some lawfulness there. We have to have like a composition rule. We have to be able to say, well, we have one morphism um, from A to B and another morphism from B to C. Any two morphisms, we have to have a composite between them um, going from A to C. It, you have to be able to combine morphisms to yield morphism um, from A to C here. So if we have morphism from A to B and another one from B to C, there has to be uh, amorphism equivalent to the composition of those two from A to C. Mm. Um, and so here, all morphisms go from star to star. <laughs> and what is composition? Well, we can choose it in this case to be plus. So if we, if we do one and we compose it with two, no one says that, um, that like B can't be A and that C can't be A, so we could we could compose one and two and get three here. Like that could be our composition rule. We can choose whatever composition rule we want as long as it obeys these rules. The identity morphism combined with anything else through composition um, has to give that something else. And uh, it has to be associative, so like, if you combine, you have a morphism F and G and H, you do, 
you know, F first, um, and then G, uh, F first and, and then G, and then you, so you compose those and get something, and then you do H, it has to be the same as F, and then the composition of G and H. So it has to be kind of nice, but, but I could compose one and two and get three. That's my rule. So if I compose ID here, which is zero with itself, I get itself. If I compose it with one, I get the, this guy. If I compose it with one uh, on the starting side, I get one. Um, if I do one, one, I get two. Like this is, this is a morphism. This ain't a function. There's no function. There's no, like the star doesn't have any numbers in it. These are, are they serve as the numbers. And, um, and the identity for morphism has to be, to be lawful in this sort of way, uh, the identity morphism has to be zero. So if we add it to anything else, we get that other thing back. Um, uh, and if we add anything else to it, we get that other thing back. So here's something where the morphisms are not a function. They're numbers. Um, and you may think that's, that's wild. What do you mean they're not a function? Well, there's, there's no set it's going to and from. It's just, it's an arrow from here to itself um, that, that means a number. And when we compose it with another thing, uh, we compose any two arrows, it's the equivalent of adding those numbers. Um, that's, that's what an arrow means in this category. As long as we obey these rules, that's okay. Um, that's an okay rule to a category. Here's another one. Here, the morphisms just indicate, if we have morphism from A to B, it just says, is A less than or equal to B? If it's an arrow, is there, it means A is less than or equal to B. If there's no arrow there from A to B, it means there's, and there's no, it's not less than. And, but part of the trick is we don't draw an implicit arrow. So like this one and this one compose here to be from zero to two, but because that's implicit, um, it's implied we don't actually draw one from zero to two. Um, it's just implied by the fact that we have this to this and this to this. There has to be one from that, so we don't draw it. But here, the fact that there's an arrow from A to, A to B doesn't mean that there's a function from A to B. It just means A is less than or equal to B. It's a statement of their order. Um, the objects here are numbers and the morphisms, this is what's called the thin category. The morphisms here are very simple. So it's a pre-order. So between any two, there's either zero or one. Just is one is, you know, between A and B, there's either A is less than or equal to B or it's not. So if it's less than or equal to B, there's an arrow. It's not, it's, there's no arrow. It's, there's the hum set is empty between A and B. If, if there is, if A is less than or equal to B, then the hum set has one, one morphism in it. Here's another one. This is also a pre-order, but it, it, it reflects division, right? Like, so we draw, if we take two objects, these are the objects. If we take two, say three and 15, there's an arrow between three to 15 because three evenly divides 15. There's an arrow between three and six because it evenly divides six, but there's no arrow between three and four because it doesn't evenly divide it. So here a morphism is not a function from three to 15. It simply says, does it evenly divide 15? It's, it indicates some sort of relationship if we can speak informally between three and 15. So it's an arrow. Right? You, you could think of arrows as kind of indicating a relationship. It does, it's a type of relationship is a function, but there can be many other types of relationship. And this is just saying three divides 15. Um, but you notice it meets all the rules of a property. So if, you know, three, if there's an arrow from A to B, say three to 15, and then it's an arrow from B to C, say from 15 to 30, it also means there's got to be an implicit arrow, just not drawn, from three to 30. It has to even, in other words, it will, it must evenly divide 30. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. Um, 
It's got to be true by the nature of kind of evenly dividing. It's got to be true. So here the arrows just mean it evenly divides it. This is also a thin category, by the way. Either there's an arrow between two things or there's, there's none. Um, and the identity morphism here um, corresponds to A divides itself. Mm, yeah, not very significant. The identity morphism here corresponded from A to A is A is less than or equal to A. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, any two paths uh, from say one to three have to give the, have to give the, the, the it's the same exact um, uh, morphism. It's, it's going to be the same because there's only one from one to three, um, no matter how you get there, um, or from one to five. Here's another one. So here we have a morphism. It again is some sort of relationship between them. Um, uh, between A and B, if A is a subset of B, not necessarily, not necessarily, or not, doesn't have to be a proper subset, just a subset. Um, so here, one comma three is a subset of zero, one, three now. Um, and uh, we have composition because if, if we see that from A to B, one, three is a subset of zero, one, three, and we see it from B to C, if zero, one, three is a subset of zero, one, two, three, then it follows that one, three is a subset of zero, one, three. Um, so if we have an arrow like this, so we have another arrow like that, there's got to be an arrow conceptually, we just not drawn because it's implicit, it's implied from one, three to zero, one, two, three. So here, an arrow is not a function, it's not it's not turning a one three into a zero one three. It just indicates it. It's a subset. Okay. Now, what I've been illustrating these with is something called a Hasse diagram. And you may be wondering, oh wait, a, no, no, this is kind of interesting because you said this is a thin category where we we have arrows meaning divides. This is a thin category as well where arrows indicate less than or equal to. This is a thin category where arrows indicate less than or equal to, or sorry, um, um, uh, it indicates subset relationship. A Hasse diagram sort of, we speak about it presenting a category, it diagrams a category. It doesn't fully specify the rules of that category as we'll see, but it sort of provides a, uh, uh, a presentation of it, a, a sort of an abstraction of it, as it were. And we call this a Hasse diagram. And the rules of this are we don't draw things that are implicitly present. Um, like we don't draw self arrows that are, uh, excuse me, I should be careful here. I want to emphasize, you can have lots of self arrows in a diagram. This diagram, lots of self arrows, but we draw them. The one I showed in dotted line, by terms of a Hasse diagram, I shouldn't have drawn because it's implicit. It's always there. You always have to have an identity morphism, um, which here indicates zero. So I shouldn't have drawn it, but I drew it because it was one of the first things you saw and I just wanted to show. But these are self arrows here. They're from, a to, they're from star to star, but they're self arrows, but they're not implied. So we show them. It's not that we don't draw any self arrows. We draw self arrows that are not identity arrows. But every, every object has an identity. That's the one we don't draw. And we don't draw results of composition. So here we have something from B to O and O to N. We just don't draw one from B to N. It has to be there. We know it has to be there because we can see these two. There's gotta be one there corresponding to it. And hey, this one, this one from B to A and O to, or A to O and O to N. So there's gotta be one from B to N as well um, through that path. So you might ask, are they the same? Um, maybe, maybe there's more than one or is there just one? Well, we'll see. We actually have some choice about it. This won't tell us, the Hasse diagram won't tell us, but neither of them are shown because they're, if there's more than one, it's not shown because they're both, you know, are, you know, at least one is implied. So we just don't draw any. Um, uh, and it does not uniquely specify the rules of the category. So here's the same Hasse diagram um, for two possibilities. One, 
we have this, we saw it before. Uh, this arrow means like if there's an arrow from, oh, now I'm in trouble, from B to A, it means B is less than or equal to A, right? Or if there's one from B to C, ah, this will be the ticket. B to C, it means B is less than or equal to C. There we go, there we go. Um, and if there's one from C to D, it means C is less than or equal to D. And the composition means that B is less than or equal to D. And oh my gosh, I drew it. I uh, shouldn't have drawn it. Okay. Um, shouldn't, have, shouldn't have drawn it um, uh, for, for this one. Um, okay. Um, so, because it's, it's implied. But um, here, um, uh, there's only, this is one extreme because between B and D, there's only one or zero. Between any two objects, there's only one or zero. That's what we call it a thin category. Um, uh, the monoid, that very first thing we saw, this is, this is like a very simple structure for objects. There's one object, that's it. And we have lots of morphisms here, some rich morphisms with rich rules associated with them. Here, we have kind of lots of objects, but it's we have very simple morphisms. Between any two pairs, we have zero or one. And so like this morphism is drawn between B and D. It's gotta be the same, no matter how many different ways we can reach D. We can reach it this way, or we can reach it this way, or we can reach it that way. Um, all those ways have got to be the the same, and it makes sense, right? If if B is less than A, which is or less than or equal to A, which is less than or equal to O, which is less 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 than or equal to C, uh, which is less than or equal to D, then it follows that B is less than or equal to D, and we don't have to, you know. It, it doesn't tell us any more that we say B is less than or equal to C, which is less than or equal to D. Well, we haven't told anything new. We knew already B is less than or equal to D. So here there's only one, one relation of that sort, one morphism of that sort, one relationship. It, we have only one possible thing we've got to know. Um, any two paths have the same exact value. Um, for for this morphism. B is less than or equal to D. Okay, any two paths from B to D have exactly the same implication. Okay, so that's that's a thin version of this category for the same Hasse diagram. Now let's go to a, the opposite extreme. So in their book, uh, Seven Rule, Seven Sketches of Compositionality, this is shown as one extreme. Now let's take the other extreme. This is an extreme because we have very, very few it's very restrictive. We have, you know, as few kind of morphisms as possible here within the implications of this structure. Now let's go to the free category. Free category has as many as possible. We don't restrict any. We, we as long we all we do is we the only restrictions we impose are the restrictions to be a category. So here's the free category. Get this same diagram, same diagram. There it is. Same diagram. Um, here, the morphisms from B to D are all paths between B and D. And it's a set of all paths. And each of those is different, right? The path from B to D directly is different than B to C to D. And that's a different path than B to O to C to D. And that's a different path from B to A to O to C to D. Those are all different paths. Um, oh, excuse me, I should have been on this diagram. Those are all different paths for this free category. I was accidentally on this while I was saying that, but I meant for this free category. It's a set of all paths. Um, okay, okay. So if I compose here, what am I doing? If I compose B to C, and I'm composing C to D. Basically, it's like I'm appending all possible ones to this, to all possible ones to that, to get all possible ones from B to D. Um, uh, that's what it gives me. It's a, it's a kind of, um, 
for any morphism from B to any path from B to C and any path from C to D, I get a path from B to D. Um, if I have a different way of getting from B to C and, and, uh, I, and, and a way of getting from C to D, then I get a different path. Um, and here, identity morphisms correspond to zero length paths. So here, a morphism from one thing to another indicates a path from that to the other. And here, there's lots of, like the hum set from B to D, the number of morphisms, there's a whole swack of them. There's a whole bunch of them. There's one for each path here. Oh, man. Um, for each path from, from B to D, um, there's, uh, there's many, many of them. Uh, so we have many of these that are implied here. And, um, and so for this, this is called the free category because we're not restricting, uh, restricting them. And we have these, these paths. So what I'm trying to communicate is, are, morphism, are, are morphisms functions? Well, for some categories, morphisms are functions. And I always like to think back to those categories because a lot of my intuition comes from there. But there's lots of categories where morphisms are not functions. They're other things like they're numbers or they are you know, indications of a relationship that's like one is less than or equal to another, indication of one is a subset of the other, or they could be representing paths. And those are all equally good morphisms to functions. So when we think categorically, don't get caught up in always thinking they're functions. Sometimes they're functions, sometimes they ain't functions. There are other things. And as long as they abide by these rules, as long as they're good abiding, you know, they're, they're, they abide by the rules of categories, they are, um, it's a perfectly good category and they're good categorical citizens. They're categorically good citizens, um, to put it in Kantian prose. Um, okay, I don't know if that's helpful, Jenna, but um, morphisms can be functions for some, in some categories, morphisms are functions. And those are beautiful categories, but in a lot of categories, morphisms are not not functions. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, the whole idea of the context rich content doesn't matter as much. Doesn't have to be a function. It's more about the rules and relationship. Doesn't yeah. have to be a Got function. It. And there will even be some categories um, where you will have the morphisms. The morphisms will represent a relationship that's kind of um, structure preserving between two things. It's not just any old relationship. It's it's like a homomorphism between from one monoid to another. It's like a, a, a way of mapping from the first monoid to the second that's nice. It has it observes, it, it preserves the structure at the first one when it maps to the second one. So it sounds like a function, but it's a nice function. It's a, it's a well-behaved function. It's a, it's a upstanding function. It's a law-abiding function. And, and a lot of category theory has that flavor. The, um, the, the links between things are kind of uh, law abiding, particularly when you go to these sort of higher structures, a category of um, a category of, of monoids or a category of functors where the mappings are natural transformations or a category of small categories. And the, the, the mappings are, are functors between them. Um, and those functors are things that preserve structure in one category when they're mapping to another. And those are the morphisms. They're, they're things that are kind of the, the good mappings, um, not just any old willy-nilly mapping. And there they're not functions either. They're kind of good mappings. They're good, good, good arrows. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. Um, additional questions though. I wanna make sure we, we get to your questions or, or comments or confusions.
so I know this, there's a lot of stuff taking place here in terms of new, new concepts and so on. I do want to emphasize that we're going to be kind of going back and forth in the course and in some of our comments here in the, in the, the program of categories course, you'll see it in the video for next time. Um, and in this, these comments between sort of almost a, uh, an intuitionist or, or philosophical perspective on things and nitty gritty examples in mathematical definitions. Um, uh, you know, what we have here is a mathematical set of, uh, oops, mathematical um, characterization of a, of a category. And it looks kind of dry and, and disconnected, but there's a, there's an intuition here. Um, like all of these lighter things deal with composition. This is all about taking the mapping seriously. Um, this is morphisms and everything else about here is about morphisms. The objects kind of retreat for the background. And one aspect you'll see in kind of category theory is, um, you know, it's about the relationships and it's about taking relationships seriously um uh and and and, and deal, dealing with them as first class entities um that's really what allows category to, theory to kind of be so successful and and take itself and, and studying itself and, and take itself to higher levels etc um we're gonna see that one of the reasons objects go to the background is because like objects that are, um, objects are almost defined by their relations. It's kind of like we say, you know, we judge a person by the company they keep, um, or you can tell a lot about a person by who they hang around. Um, um, and in category theory, um, it's, it's really the, the role the object plays in the category that distinguishes it. And that role is, is determined by its relations, its relations in and its relations out. Um, the objects are just dots. We're not, we're not thinking about, and this is important for Jenna's question. We're not saying like, what's in that dot? What's in that star dot? Tell me what's, what's inside of it. Let's crack it open and look, right? We're, we're not getting to that level. Um, unlike set theory where we're, peering inside, you know, we're, we're, we tend to be just think of the air. Okay, these objects are just these dots. And, and if there's two objects that function in the same way, they have all the same, same sort of relations into them and the same relations out, for all the intents and purposes, they're playing the same roles and will we'll often collapse them. It, we'll, we'll say, well, okay, if they're isomorphic, um, they play the same role in the category. It's just, you know, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Um, we'll, we'll call them the same thing. We'll collapse them down. And in fact, there's a thing called the skeleton category, which, you know, sounds scary and maybe, maybe we'll scare small children on Halloween, but it will, um, the skeleton category, it's like you take a category and you boil down the things that are isomorphic into a single object. So. So objects are kind of, they come along for the ride, but you know, they're, they're not the center of our attention. In fact, they're, they're, their existence is less, less fixed than you might think because it's dependent on their relations with other things. So really all the attention is about these morphisms. Um, and it is important to get out of the, the, the rut of thinking about morphisms are always functions. Morphisms are about a lot more than functions. And if you can keep your mind broad like that, you'll be less freaked out or less confused when you see certain things. Next time we'll see that um, even like the nature of what, what is um, associated with a given object is, is dictated by the morphisms. And we'll keep on going back to set where we, where we have this propensity to ask, what are, what are its elements? You know, earlier I was saying for each element of A, we pick a B. Um, so we use that intuition, but 
we have to realize that doesn't handle all categories. And what we'll learn is that if we can use that intuition the right way, we can transcend it, we can move beyond it. And so we learn, for example, wait a minute, like if we have, if we have a map from A to B as, as sets, and, and the map is a function here from A to B, hmm. um, and A is just one thing in it, there's just one possible value, then how many functions are there? Well, there's just one for each element of B, if, if, if we're dealing with mapping between sets with a function here. Um, it's just, there's one of those functions for the one that, you know, for the only thing that's an A, it gives it the first value of B. That's one of the functions. Another function is for the only thing that's an A, it gives it the second value of B, possible value of B. Another one is, gives it the third value of B. Each of those is a separate function. Now, how many functions are, oh, well, it's the count of things in B, the count of elements in B. So, so like, set is very special in that sense that the number of items in B is the same as the number of morphisms, functions, from something that's of size one into that thing. <laughs> like, we could think of those functions from a thing of size one, smiley face, star, whatever you want to call it, a set of size one. What the things, the number of possible functions into B is the same as the number of items in B. It's kind of those functions serve as a kind of generalized elements of B. They're kind of a name for the elements of B. Rather than speak about the elements, we can talk about the, the functions, the morphisms. Ah, okay. Now that's a thought that can take us to the next level. Now we don't have to deal with the, the pesky elements of B. We don't have to look inside B. We just deal with the functions into it. We say, there's eight functions into it from a thing which is of size one. Okay, that tells us all we need to know. Now we're dealing in terms of functions. We don't have to look inside to see about what's the, the first element is an apple, the second element is a bat, the third element is a cat, and the fourth element is a dog. Um, we don't need to do that. Um, uh, we, we could just deal with the functions. And so we'll see next time that we have this notion of sort of um, objects as probes and category theory. And we develop that intuition when we're dealing with um, set. And, and then we can extend it beyond that and we'll use objects as shapes. So when we get to dynamical systems, we'll see this intuition is really nice. We can use a shape to denote a fixed point of a dynamical system or another shape to denote the time trajectories of a dynamical system or another fixed point to note sort of a cyclical pattern in, in that system with a clock. And it's really interesting. Um, but more than that, I, I do just want to say, you know, you're going to hear me play down set. But at the end of the day, set is going to keep on coming back to us. It's going to be our friend. It's going to be our trusted friend we keep on coming back to. We have to think more broadly can't think only in the world about our friend. But because of this, we always have a set of morphisms from two, between any two objects. It's a set, ladies and gentlemen. It's a set. And wherever we go with our categories, we're going to have this set following us around. It's the HOM set between any two objects. And the fact that that's a set it's gonna be really useful because we know how to deal with sets. We know what we can do with them. We know about functions between sets. And the fact that that is a set is gonna give us a lot of advantages. And it's gonna mean that set is not just any old category. It's a, it's a quite nice category. Um, and and it's, a quite, it's a quite nice category. Um, and it's one that's gonna have continued relevance in any category because the HOM sets for any category are going to be sets. And that's going to be really, really quite useful. And we're going to come back to that again and again and again. This is a set. Um, and it's going to play a role in the Yoné dilemma, for example, in an important way. So those are some comments about where we're going. So I'd like you to look at lecture two uh, for next time, uh, programming with categories. Um, 
and uh, there we'll be seeing pre-orders, we'll be seeing monoids, and we'll be seeing this notion of a shape, a probe that 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 the functions, the morphisms from something to something else can be used as kind of um, as kind of an observer that observes other things. And this will start getting us thinking in some ways categorically about things. So we're going to see those next time. We're going to see a recap of, of categories um, and um, be starting to get our sea legs in um, how does this relate a little bit to Haskell um, and uh, talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the Hask, the category Hask and where these, um, where these concepts apply there. So that's for next time. That's two days from now. That's Friday. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting together with you then. Let's come, try to come with some questions, try to come with some confusions or, or puzzlements, and uh, let's talk about them next time. If I'm going to give you a little um, question for next time, I'll try to send it tonight. And uh, I'm going to need to figure out how to get those things submittable on Canvas. OK, so that's all for today. Let us meet on Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you.